Uh, talk a lot tonight about um, sort of our approach to nutrition and what we think is um, is going to be the most beneficial for you. Uh, I always preface this by saying though that um, I'm not a registered dietitian and uh, all of the things I'm talking about really I'm speaking from experience. This is how I've eaten and this is how I've had success um, and that the clients that we've had that have followed these kind of guidelines have also had similar successes. Um, but, but it is important for me to say right up front that technically it is out of my scope of practice to tell you how to eat and that everything I say ought to be checked or bounced off of your physician. A right, little disclaimer kind of there. So I usually start out um, by trying to debunk what is the kind of governing um, philosophy and um, kind of approach to weight loss and nutrition in this country and that is um, what's been uh, termed the calorie deficit model of weight loss and the calorie deficit model of weight loss you've probably all heard it if you've ever watched like anything like Dr. Oz or any of these kind of shows you've heard this over and over again the calories in and calories out formula right and, and the idea that if you take in fewer calories than you expend then you will lose weight um, and uh, although this is this is a truth it's actually like a law of physics you know, it, it's irrefutable fact, but a gross like oversimplification of weight loss. Um, and so, what I want to set out first is why that <clears throat> is not a um, not a real uh, viable framework with which to hang eating habits on. Um, and I always try to do that by drawing this metaphor of everybody's inner accountant. Um, and uh, if you can imagine uh, for a second your um, caloric needs on a daily basis. So keeping your body warm, fueling activities, um, thought is a big calorie burner, all these activities that require calories. If you can think of them as bills, right? Um, and, uh, and, and your body has to pay those bills, right? And then think about all the food that you take in as your income, right, or your paycheck. So we've kind of got this little metaphor set up, and what happens in the calorie deficit is um, we say, you know what, you've got uh, 2,000 calories a day of caloric need, of bills to pay, and you're taking in uh, 2,000 calories a day of food. Everything's nice and homeostatic, nothing, you know, nothing changing, right? Everything's copacetic. But we decide that uh, you also have savings, <laughs> fat, right? This is, these are calories that you've stored away for a rainy day, right? They're not being actively used. They're, they're kind of in storage mode. And let's say you've got 20,000 calories of savings, of storage, okay? And you don't like having that much savings. It just feels gross. Right? You don't like the way you don't like the way it makes you feel. You, you don't look good naked, all that kind of stuff. So this right here uh, is your savings account, and what's going to happen is, your, is is Dr. Oz. I don't know why I beat up so much on Dr. Oz. I mean, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but the calorie deficit model of weight loss would say, okay, well, let's cut your calories x amount for the purposes of our you know experiment here. We'll cut it 500 calories, and and so now you're eating less than what your body needs. And what does your inner accountant do? It immediately takes right the deficit that it needs to make out the 500 calories out of this 20,000 and pays bills with it. And this is usually where people quit talking about the calorie deficit model. And this is how you lose weight. And they and they just kind of the story stops there. But if you have a good accountant, what does that accountant do immediately after taking from savings? What's the next thing he says to you? Either make more money, or if you're if you're incapable of spend, well, hey, you need to cut your you need to cut your budget. You need to cut this down because you only have 1,500 income now, right? So what happens is this right here, your bills, your caloric, um, you know, daily needs are mostly driven by muscle. Right? This is your bills. Okay? And so your body says, hey, you know what? Your inner accountant says, let's ditch some muscle, right? So that now our bills, now we only have $1,500 worth. Does that make sense? So, so now you're back in the same boat. You have nominally fewer 
little, you lost a little bit of weight, right? But now you have a much smaller shovel with which to dig yourself out of this metabolic hole with. You've lost that muscle. And this, over and over and over again, diet after diet, year in and year out, creates what we call, what trainers will call skinny fat. And these, these girls that you see, they're like, they're like a size six, but they're like 35% body fat, right? They look normal and healthy, but they're, they're technically morbidly obese and a size six, right? And terribly weak. Um, and, and then even beyond that, that lack of muscle tone and, and muscle mass pulling the bone ends stops signaling your bones for density because your bones are only going to be as dense as the muscles that attach to the ends require them to be. So then you have all these osteoporosis kind of issues that begin to creep in. So there's, there's a whole sort of litany of problems that can come up when you attack weight loss just from, hey, let's eat fewer calories, right? It, it's, it's a really short-sighted kind of plan. You know, it's six weeks for that adaptation to occur. Your body will ditch that muscle in a heartbeat, and, and that's how it works. So it's important when we start off our conversation, just right off the get-go, to realize that to your little, like, inner survival caveman or cavewoman, muscle is the enemy, and fat is the hero. It's not, it's opposite of what you want. You want muscle, less fat, the little caveman inside of you that's worried about survival wants tons of, as much fat as it can possibly get his hands on and only enough muscle to survive. Does that make sense? It's, it's, it's kind of a, maybe a different way of, of thinking about things. So, going forward with that sort of model of, of weight loss, this is what happened. Um, and uh, let me go back. There's three macronutrients three sort of main types of food. Um, and we can, we can divide them up into fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. And all foods will combine different mixtures of the three, but everything, it, everything is, kind of falls in one of those categories. Um, carbohydrates um, generally are calorically very sparse, which means that per volume, right, of carbohydrate, there's not that many calories in them. So, uh, for instance, I can say up here, an apple has, <clears throat> actually it's, let's see, one, two, three, one, a, a normal small size apple has close to the same calories as six almonds. And that is the same as two whole eggs. So um, what, what I'm trying to show here is, is that almonds, these six little almonds, have the same number of calories as this big apple because it's very densely you know, comprised. The fat molecule holds a lot of energy in a very small space. Okay? So if you had a food like milk, is probably my favorite example, that was a pretty even split, like 30% of the calories in a glass of milk were carb, um, you know, 40% were protein and 30% were fat. It's kind of a whole food, it's all kind of in there together. And you were a food company that was trying to market your food towards a group of people that were trying to eat fewer calories. Because all they care about is that calories in, calories out deal. The, the first thing you would do is you would just ax all the fat, you would process all the fat out of that. Right? Because you could, you could Without changing the actual product, you know, taste or anything much, you could take the fat out and you could have a reduced calorie kind of a, kind of a deal, right? Versions of those foods we know and love, they took the fat out. Does that make sense? Everybody with me on that? All right, so now the problem that occurred um, going forward from this is you've got uh, a diet, an American diet that used to be relatively balanced between the three macronutrients that now was very heavily um, slanted towards the carbohydrate. Because what happened was the proteins inherently had a bunch of fat in them also. So once fatophobia caught on, everybody cut the fat out of their diets and they, they kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater with protein because a lot of the protein sources had fat in them. Right? Y'all following me? So they quit eating eggs because of the fat. Right? Or they quit eating, you know, meats because of the fat. And then they didn't have the protein either. So there was this huge shift, all on the sake of avoiding 
you know, and creating a calorie deficit away from um, a balanced diet between these three macronutrients to just carbohydrates alone. Everybody still with me? All right. We're going to get done with the boring lecture brainy part here soon, and then we're going to answer some questions and talk about how you actually eat. I know, but th this is, it's helpful to kind of lay this, this kind of groundwork out to begin with. So one more metaphor for you, um, and I'll show you the problem with having a diet that's, that's v heavily um, comprised of by carbohydrates uh, is this campfire metaphor. And um, when you build a campfire, you um, start with newspaper. Right? Find something that burns easy and fast. And then you kind of pile on top of that some smaller sticks and twigs and something that catches on fire a little bit less readily, but once it does, it provides a little more fuel. And then the real important piece is the log, right? That takes a long time to start burning, but once it does catch on fire, it's a great energy source. I want you to think about those macronutrients, the protein, the carbohydrate, and the fat as these ingredients in a campfire, where the carbohydrate is like the newspaper. Um, your body can't use anything except glucose. Whatever you put in your mouth, if it's going to use it, it has to first change it into glucose. And um, carbohydrates are almost glucose already, right? The, the molecular process, that breakdown happens fast because it's really close to begin with. Because that's the newspaper. It doesn't provide much fuel, but it provides quick fuel, right? The sticks are kind of like the protein. A little, little more time to kind of catch on fire, a little bit more complex molecularly to get them to that glucose, that usable glucose, but um, once they do catch on fire, they're a little bit more calorically dense and they provide fuel for a little bit longer time and more heat. And then the log is the fat, right? And it just sits there. You eat the fat and it just goes in your belly and just hangs out. Like nothing, <laughs> nothing happens for a long time. It's, it's a really slow process to get that big complex fat molecule back to glucose to where it can be used. But once it gets burning, you get this nice, long, even keel kind of a deal. Well, what happened was uh, the breakfast of, you know, three eggs. Man, my dyslexia is bad tonight. Three eggs, um, you know, nine almonds, and an orange, and an apple. The protein fat, and carb trifecta. The breakfast of our grandparents, right? Everybody remember their grand, you know, maybe, probably this is a little bit hipster for your grandparents. That was probably like sausage or bacon, right? But it was protein, fat, carbohydrate, right? So this dude gets up at four o'clock in the morning because he's hardcore and he was in the war, right? And he eats this and then he goes out and works, you know, walks uphill both ways, does all that stuff, and doesn't even think about lunch until one o'clock, right? And then us, now our breakfast is oatmeal with, uh, I can't believe I'm eating plastic <laughs> and uh, orange juice, right? So we've got like carb, plastic material, and you know, it was like a fourth food group, you know, now it's not even macronutrient, it's just some... It's literally like plastic. And then more carbohydrate. And we think we're being good, right? Like a lot of you probably set out, I'm going to start dieting next week, and you ate something like this the next morning. Well, what have you built your campfire with? It's just a big pile of newspaper, right? And you light that sucker on fire, and you feel good, and you get out the door, and by 9 o'clock, man, you got the shakes, you're light, you can't think about work because you're hungry. You, you know, you just, it, your fire's out. And so, what do you do? You eat a rice cake, or pop some popcorn, or grab some pretzels in the vending machine, right? And, and so you can see what happens is, is you've set up, you've had to completely always refuel your campfire, right, with this newspaper in order to keep that fire burning. Now, inside of you, what's happening, I mean, that's annoying because it's, it makes you less productive and it's expensive because you eat a bunch of food and it's, it's bad for all sorts of reasons. But what a lot of people don't realize is the connection between this and diabetes. When you eat carbohydrate, your body produces insulin. And insulin is a hormone, you can, call, you can think about it as kind of a storage hormone, but essentially its job is to connect with a sugar molecule and usher it into the cell for use for energy. Um, and, and like the, basically, the, the the sugar is the wrong shape to go to enter into the shell into the cell. And when insulin 
combines with it, it makes it the correct shape to go through that channel. So this is a necessary thing for survival. You have to have it. But what happens is your body produces this in the pancreas and you eat carbohydrate and it pumps it out and then at 9 o'clock when your campfire is out you eat it again and your pancreas makes more insulin and you do that five or six times a day instead of three or four right to a lesser degree and eventually your pancreas is making less insulin with the same sugar stimulus. And this is what insulin resistance is, right? It's a, it's a gradual over a long period of time where every time you eat some, every time you, you make your body create some insulin, the next time through diminishing returns, it's going to need a little bit more sugar before it's going to crank out the same amount of insulin. Until eventually, you don't make enough insulin to deal with the sugar you're eating and you have just, just residual sugar bumping around in your veins all day long, trashing your eyesight and nerve endings, right? And this is, this is diabetes. And the whole fat scare, and the calorie deficit, the calorie deficit model, I believe, um, is almost exclusively necessary for the huge epidemic of type 2 diabetes in this country. Because people were keeping their campfires going, thinking they were doing the right thing with newspaper. So this is what we want. We, we, want, to avoid, we want to establish this balance with our diets and avoid this, this kind of um, slant towards the carbohydrate. Um, and there are a myriad of other benefits to reducing your carbohydrate intake, reduce inflammation. Um, you know, I could go on and on and on about it, but um, the most important thing is that you just realize that um, this, this way of eating right here, you're leaving a lot of um, you know good nutrients kind of on the table. Um, and if you were doing it just to reduce your calorie intake, that was a bad plan. That was a bad plan. All right, moving on now. <laughs>